everyone welcome and uh, it's a wednesday evening and i'm glad that we are back with some more success stories with some more topics as you know yesterday we actually talked about uh recurrent miscarriages tonight we will continue this particular topic and um, this topic definitely brings a lot, lot lots and lots of questions and we have a special guest with us dr ksenia kazilenko is with us so hello dr ksenia how are you feeling and thank you Hello, hello, everybody. Hello, and um, how are you feeling? All is good, I hope. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All is good. Uh, thank you, Carolina, for inviting me and, and uh, for organizing my uh, first experience here in your platform. And uh, I will be glad to uh, uh, answer your question on our guests today. Excellent. That's why we are here for sure. So as always, you know that we will start with Dr. Xenia's presentation. She will provide um, success cases, um, of course, based on recurrent miscarriages, patients that went through recurrent miscarriages. And afterwards, uh, as always, there will be time for your, for your questions. So don't forget to type those in in the chat section so that Dr. Xenia can help you out with them. And as you know, we are here not every single day, but uh, we are here very, very often just to support you, to give you this opportunity to ask your questions on various topics. And this autumn, we are focusing on success stories. Um, and of course, um, the more success stories we've got here, the more happy we are, because that means that uh, whatever any doctor is doing, that works. Even though there are sometimes some obstacles, it's not there are not easy cases for sure. Uh, but of course, we always need to look for positives and it, it can happen. It can happen to you. Um, but there are always some um, options that doctors can find and diagnose and then fix this as well. And of course, this um, success story that uh, Dr. Xenia will present is about this. OK, so stay tuned. Have a look at this. And of course, remember to ask your questions. This is your time. And remember, this is uh, free of charge. It's anonymous. So um, you can just feel free and uh, go ahead and do it and use this time to get some advice perhaps as well. Okay. And um, this is it from me at this point, Dr. Xenia. Let's begin with your presentation then. Okay. So let's start. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you one more. And uh, yeah, I'm ready to, to start my presentation. Oi, sorry, sorry, this is the second slide. And I would like to start uh, for the first one. And uh, I would like to present to you uh, two cases uh, of uh, my patient. And uh, I would like to uh, show you on these cases that uh, recurrent pregnancy losses is a very complicated condition, very uh, multifactorial and uh, circum uh, circumflexes of this uh, condition can be very complicated and our uh, conclusions can be sometimes uh, very difficult. So uh, I also would like to show you that not all, sorry, uh, that sometimes uh, success of uh, recurrent pregnancy losses patient uh, not just a medical success, sometimes it's uh, part of, of the miracle. And I want uh, to start from this uh, very, very famous uh, Shakespeare uh, today. Uh, let's, let's move on. And this is my first, first uh, slide, first story. It's Victoria. It's my uh, young patient. She's uh, 28 years old. And uh, your hus uh, her husband uh, twice older, and then she and uh, she came to me with uh, history of five so-called biochemical pregnancy, biochemical, uh, biochemical or preclinical pregnancy. It's pregnancies when uh, she had just a positive uh, test on pregnancy, and then uh, when she provided blood test on uh, hormone. Uh, ACG hormone, uh, she had that uh, a little bit higher um, level of ACG and then just, uh, it started to drop down and she started to bleed, unfortunately. And uh, she had uh, five uh, this experience and uh, on the first consultation, she was very, very tired. I can uh, even say that she was exhausted and she was disappointed. She was almost uh, depressed. 
and uh, of course despite and uh, she came to ask me about IVF program and about what uh, can I uh, how can I explain her uh, negative experience so uh, firstly I studied her uh, test results and the good news that she had uh, absolutely normal karyotyping, body mass index, uterine, uh, uterine anatomy. She had normal ovarian reserve and uh, her husband, despite on uh, age, had absolutely normal semen parameters and also she had normal uh, thyroid function and uh, endometrium and no signs of uh, endometritis. So it was the good news, but but she also had she also had uh, you can see um, she had uh, higher risk of uh, thrombotic events because she has high level of antiphospholipid antibodies and it was twice and uh, she was unfortunately despite his, uh, this history she had uh, she was smoker and she smoked uh, 10 uh, cigarettes a day uh, during a very very long time and also additionally she was uh, homozygous on pie mutation and also it's uh, very important that in your family history uh, your mother died uh, quite early from thrombosis so uh, of course she had very high risk of thrombotic events during pregnancy and her conclusions was recurrent pregnancy losses and uh, of course antiphospholipid syndrome antiphospholipid syndrome it's uh, exactly it's uh, the problem for the pregnancy and uh, of course, uh, this is uh, a situation with high risks of uh, thrombotic event during pregnancy. But, but uh, mostly these thrombotic events can happen uh, a bit later in the second and third trimester. And uh, because for thrombotic events in placenta and umbilical cord, uh, we need to have these uh, blood vessels and uh, in uh, very early pregnancy, it's, um, I hesitate that it was possible. And uh, also there are some publications about uh, antiphospholipid uh, antibodies in uh, patient in IVF prog uh, programs. And there are some data that uh, this patient sometimes can have even increased possibility uh, to become pregnant in IVF program, but unfortunately with, uh, in, with worse result uh, during uh, second and third trimester. So uh, I had to explain to Victoria all these, uh, all my uh, ideas. And I had explained that uh, maybe the reason for her uh, miscarri early miscarriage was uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, but uh, in real life, uh, mostly of uh, early, very early pregnancy losses are uh, because of chromosomal pathology, of course. So uh, before making the decision, I uh, explained her and uh, she, she have to choose between uh, natural conception and IVF program with uh, genetic testing. But anyway, in... Uh, um, and despite on the on your choice, uh, she had uh, had been treated, but uh, by antithrombotic therapy, by uh, low molecular weight, heparin and aspirin, uh, despite on natural conception or IVF. So Victoria have chosen IVF program, and uh, we have started. We have started from ovarian stimulation, and. Uh, we took uh, during simulation 20 eggs. It was uh, good for, for your age and uh, almost all eggs were fertilized. And we took uh, eight blastocysts and it was good result for, for your uh, age and for your number of eggs. But, but uh, as you can see, just one embryo was euploid on the result of genetic testing and it was absolutely abnormal for this young age. So uh, first conclusion that uh, uh, the reason of uh, early losses can be in uh, chromosomal pathology. 
despite on her normal career time. So uh, good news that she had uh, normal euploid embryo and uh, we can uh, we could plan uh, embryo transfer and embryo transfer was provided in a natural prepared cycle and uh, of course we have started low molecular weight heparin and aspirin from uh, type of, uh, time of transfer and uh, good news she had uh, she was pregnant and she was appointed to ultrasound examination firstly after two weeks after positive result and this is not the end of this story and this is your first uh, ultrasound and it was uh, it was wow news because on ultrasound you can see it was twin despite on single embryo transfer uh, yes, uh, sometimes approximately 2% of uh, single embryo transfer, we, we can have twins because, uh, because of splitting uh, uh, of embryo in the uh, very early stage uh, after implantation. Uh, but uh, majority of, of these twins are monozygotes, so they are uh, in origin from one embryos. And uh, usually uh, this type of twins uh, on the first ultrasound, we can see just one uh, amniotic sac with two embryos. But there is, uh, in, on the picture, you can see two uh, amniotic sac with two absolutely different embryos. So. What can be the reason? What can be the problem? Is it uh, what, what happens? Uh, so, in this case, firstly, uh, we can think about not about splitting this embryo, but we uh, can think about uh, natural conception uh, before embryo transfer. So, it was natural cycle and. Um, uh, traditionally, before transfer in natural cy cycle, we, we strongly uh, recommend to patient to, to use contraception. But um, unfortunately, not always patient uh, use our recommendation. Uh, and any anyway, when we can see uh, twins, dichronic diamniotic twins, uh, as on this picture, on this slide, uh, firstly, uh, we can see about uh, this situation with natural conception plus uh, pregnancy of the transfer. But it's uh, not a good news because uh, this was uh, the program with genetic testing. And we, we know that one embryo was really healthy uh, with female normal karyotype, uh, type. But uh, if it was natural conception, so we don't know uh, nothing about second embryo and it was really can be really the problem so on this first ultrasound we didn't know uh, what happens uh, let's look let's look uh, what will be next so it will uh, it was uh, twins and uh, of course as uh, as i have already mentioned i started um, antithrombotic uh, prophylaxis from embryo transfer and uh, this uh, antithrombotic therapy was very very complicated during the pregnancy because uh, she bleeds all the time she bleed uh, from early pregnancy she, it was not spotting it was uh, sometimes uh, severe uh, bleeding uh, from others from one side we know that during uh, pregnancy after IVF especially in case of twins uh, our patient can bleed uh, can have spotting in early pregnancy and, and sometimes it's uh, normal but uh, it was a really strong bleeding and uh, we thought a lot, we, we provided a lot of tests, but uh, we decided firstly um, cancel aspirin. It was canceled in uh, 80 week of, week of pregnancy. And later we have canceled uh, also low molecular weight giparin. It was uh, very risky for this situation because we know that patient with antiphospholipid uh, syndrome can help not just miscarriages uh, and not just uh, intrauterine deaths, but uh, they can have also um, uh, later uh, obstetric complication. And uh, in this situation, um, we decided to cancel antithrombotic therapy. It was uh, our this Victoria decision uh, because she was really very worried and I can understand her 
and she decided don't use uh, these shots despite all the risk for, for the future pregnancy. And uh, this pregnancy uh, progressed till uh, 30 weeks of pregnancy, it was normal. But starting from uh, 30 weeks, uh, uh, interrupting growth restriction uh, started from one from fetus. And uh, during one month, it was uh, monitoring of uh, condition of both fetuses. And uh, after one month, uh, condition one of them become worse uh, and was uh, disturbance of blood flow. And it was decided to, to induce delivery. So her delivery was uh, by cesarean section despite, uh, regarding the situation. And it was two girls and two girls, uh, as you can see, uh, the discordance between these uh, twins was almost 50, not almost, it was 50 percent. Uh, but uh, fortunately, despite this, uh, both girls were healthy and now they are uh, six years old. They are healthy now and <laughs> you can see that uh, they are identical. So the answer on, on the question, on first question of first ultrasound, what happens? Uh, this embryo uh, have split it after uh, embryo transfer uh, after implantation. It was really very, very uncommon situation with uh, monochorionic twins with uh, two different uh, amniotic sacs. It, it was really uh, rare. So, so. What is the conclusion from this uh, Victoria's history? The first conclusion that uh, um, RPL can be caused by different condition. And uh, despite some very obvious conclusion, we, can, uh, we need to continue uh, our testing, our examination, even if we thought that we know all about uh, possibly reason because we can, uh, it, was, it can be the mistake like in the Victoria situation. Uh, the second that uh, despite uh, first conclusion, early losses mostly happen due to, uh, due to uh, chromosomal pathology. So uh, we, need, we need to provide full examination. Uh, the next conclusion that antiphospholipid uh, syndrome, it's really uh, the risk for, for the pregnancy and without treatment, a patient uh, often have uh, not just pregnancy losses, but also uh, late obstetricans, uh, obstetrican uh, complication with uh, neonatal uh, risks. So, so the treatment is very important. The, the next one is uh, that um, if we suspect uh, chromosomal pathology is the reason for recurrent mis miscarriages, we should recommend, we should at least discuss with patient um, IVF program with genetic testing. It can be very helpful with, uh, in this situation. Uh, we also need strong, should strongly recommend uh, contraception because uh, before transfer in natural cycle, and uh, we should uh, keep in mind that uh, sometimes single embryo transfer can result in twins, even in uh, dichorionic and diamniotic twins, like in Victoria case. And uh, this is a unique, unique uh, photo because it's a real Victoria photo. The Victoria embryo, uh, embryo before transfer, and uh, this uh, collage uh, was created by uh, by embryology who provided embryo transfer, and on uh, on uh, she was uh, impressed by this embryo. This is on the picture. This is not uh, splitting of embryo. This is a, a process uh, for expanded blastocyst who want uh, implants uh, very much and. Uh, our embryologist, uh, she she saw in this picture this uh, very similar to the uh, picture uh, from the right side uh, situation, and it was uh, the time uh, when we didn't know uh, result of this pregnancy. We didn't know about twins. We didn't know about what happens with Victoria. It, uh, up to me, it's really a unique story and a unique photo. Uh, 
so let's let's move on. Let's move on for, for the second uh, second case, and this is uh, the patient. Uh, patient Anna, she's in her middle of reproductive age, and she came to me with uh, three pregnancy losses uh, early, the same, but it was not biochemical, it was clinical pregnancies, uh, but uh, first trimester losses. And uh, in one, one of three, this pregnancy was provided uh, genetic testing product, product of conception, and the result was uh, so-called normal female carrier type. So let's look. Let's look on on the test results. On, on the results, they are uh, mostly normal uh, thyroid function. She didn't have uh, antiphospholipid uh, antibodies. Uh, she had normal BMI. Her husband. Uh, uh, had uh, normal sperm parameters, and in uh, conclusions which which uh, she bring to me, uh, uterine anatomy was uh, described as normal. So uh, this is on the uh, left side uh, your con previous conclusion, and on the right side the picture with uh, three D ultrasound which I provided, and uh, this is, you can see, that it's typical, um, typical uterine septum uh, in this photo. And what does it mean? It means that uh, it was the uh, very common mistake, uh, very common for, for the last year, maybe it's not now, but five, uh, three years ago, it was typical that uh, uterine assessment was provided on 2D ultrasound, and uh, uh, this is despite on recommendation of sorry recommendation of uh, American and European uh, Reproductive Society that uh, the best way to provide uterine uh, cavity assessment by 3D ultrasound because uh, very high uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, specificity of uh, 3D in uh, diagnostic of uterine abnormalities. So. This is the gold standard for uterine assessment. And uh, what do we have? Uh, we have also the results so-called, I mentioned that it's so-called uh, normal female karyotype. So why, uh, what's wrong with this karyotype? Uh, the problem is that uh, this is miscarriage. First one, this is miscarriage. The second one, this, uh, this is very early miscarriage. And uh, in very early miscarriage, when cytogenetic provide uh, testing, uh, he or she should uh, share mater um, embryonic and maternal tissues. In, in a very early pregnancy, it's very difficult because uh, part embryonic part in early pregnancy is very, very small, as you can see in, uh, in the first picture. Uh, uh, and uh, after eight weeks of pregnancy, usually we can very easy share these two parts, maternal and uh, embryonic. But in early pregnancy, usually when we take uh, get the result with uh, normal female career time, in most cases, it means that it's maternal contamination, that we, uh, we tested uh, maternal tissue, but not embryonic. Uh, of course, in early pregnancy, if we get the result with, uh, no, for instance, uh, normal male career type, it means uh, that, uh, that it's not uh, maternal contamination, of course. And uh, when we get uh, abnormal career type, it uh, also means that it's not maternal tissue. But in this case, uh, before uh, eight weeks of pregnancy, we can uh, be sure that it's really embryonic or not if we didn't didn't test uh, maternal blood for for this type of uh, contamination and what do we have with uh, with anna we have of course recurrent miscarriage we have uh, uterine abnormality abnormality septate so-called septate utera and also we know um, we have unknown chromosomal status, uh, one of three miscarriage, and we don't know nothing about uh, two 
miscarriages. And uh, as in case with Victoria, we can uh, decide uh, the same in this situation that uh, will be better to provide the pre-implantation genetic testing. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. We should uh, to discuss it with a uh, patient. But firstly, I uh, should discuss uh, influence of uh, uterine septum in pregnancy. Is it really a matter all, uh, in uh, all situations? Is it really a problem in 100%? Uh, exactly no, because um, sometimes we can find uh, uterine septum in uh, patient who during, uh, for instance, during cesarean section, or in patient who had uh, normal delivery, uh, and uh, it means that not always the septum can be the problem. The matter is uh, where is the uh, place for implantation? And, uh, and you can see on the left picture that in case if uh, implantation echo on the, on the walls of uterine left or right or back on in front of, uh, it's a good idea at a good place. And in this case, the pregnancy can be absolutely normal. But, but. Uh, more often with, uh, in history with septum, embryo uh, want to implant on the septum. And uh, implantation on septum, it's really risky because uh, it's not normal uh, myometrium, it's not normal endometrium in the septum. Uh, in the septum. And uh, implantation in this uh, place um, usually, usually ended on miscarriage. So the matter just on place, but even in case of IVF in uh, during embryo transplant, we can uh, we cannot put uh, embryo on uh, those place uh, we want uh, because uh, usually embryo uh, embryo uh, choose by itself the place for implantation. So what to do? We need uh, to get the sun to uh, to choose between firstly between a metroplasty to remove uh, uterine septum or not, or just uh, just wait, or the second one we we should choose between IVF natural conception, and uh, she have chosen. Sorry, it's a bit early, and uh, we. Uh, she have chosen uh, expectant management and hysteroscopy, and uh, you can see that uh, you can see that uh, quite early after hysteroscopy she became pregnant, and uh, your preg her pregnancy was almost well, but uh, just from 16 weeks she had a shortening of. Uh, uh, cervix and cervical, so-called cervical insufficiency, but uh, cervical circulation was successfully used. Um, cervical insufficiency, it's typical situation uh, with, uh, to, for women with uh, uterine abnormality, despite on surgery or not, uh, they can often have uh, shortening of uh, cervix during pregnancy. So, uh, Circulage for Anna was successful and she gave birth a term with norm, by normal healthy uh, girl, as you can see. And uh, what are my conclusions from this situation? Firstly, that the gold, gold standard for uterine uh, cavity assessment is 3D, of course. Uh, and for patients with uh, septum, we, we should propose and should discuss with them uh, metroplasty, but expectant, expectant man, uh, management also could be option uh, because, uh, uh, as I mentioned, this pregnancy can be absolutely normal. And uh, during pregnancy, despite on surgery, these women uh, have risk of uh, cervical insufficiency. And also my conclu conclusion that a result of genetic testing in early pregnancy sometimes uh, need additional review, as I show in my previous slide. 
and uh, in the end of my presentation i would like to uh, just present that this uh, modern conception for reproductive medicine uh, and for recurrent miscarriage and for infertility treatment that patient who came to reproductive clinic clinic uh, should not just uh, become pregnant not just uh, give birth but uh, the last result the main result is uh, uh, take home baby yeah she, she have to come uh, home with healthy baby this is really good result and good idea and uh, i thank you for your attention and this is my my clinic uh, in kiev ukraine my clinic provides uh, almost 2,000 IVF cycle per, per year, and, and yeah, I really proud that this is a place of my work. And the last slide is uh, my city, Kiev. It's my favorite place on the planet. So from uh, Ukraine with love, and uh, this is the finish of my presentation. And I'm ready to ask you a question if they are. Thank you. Thank you so much for providing those details, those two cases. Definitely um, not easy ones, but uh, of course, as I mentioned, this is uh, amazing that you are still able to get that uh, successful uh, outcome. And of course, uh, right now, as you are, you are very right, it's time for your questions. So as always, if you have any questions, this is your time. Dr. Ksenia is here for you to um, answer anything that you might have. Uh, but also, I always want to uh, remind everyone that if you would like to get in touch with Dr. Ksenia and anyone at the team at the I've met in Kiev, then I'm sure they will be more than happy to help you out with any questions that you might have. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate. Go ahead. Okay. Don't Wait, hesitate. Okay. Sometimes we just need some more um, minutes for all the patients to think about their questions. So let's give it a minute. I don't see any yet, but I'm sure there will be some. So let's, let's wait. I'm not sure. I don't know where to find uh, to find. This. I will show you in a second. We just need to wait for the very first question. Okay. So if you have okay. any questions, this is your uh, time. Okay. First question. Okay. Thank you, okay, Ali, for your first I need, question. I need my glasses. Yes, uh -huh. of course. I will read it for you as well. So, what is the most common problem that miscarriage patient a patient's face? Okay, okay. This is a good question. Thank you. And uh, all depends on uh, really on term of pregnancy. Uh, um, as I already mentioned, the, for uh, early pregnancy, the the most cases uh, caused by chromosomal pathology, of course. But if we are talking about uh, late term uh, miscarriage, when, when we are talking about miscarriage, we mean uh, uh, that uh, the uh, last term of a pregnancy for miscarriage is uh, 22. For Ukraine, it's uh, a bit different for different countries, but for Ukraine, it's uh, 22 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, so-called obstetrical uh, weeks from uh, first day of last menstrual bleeding. And uh, for different countries, it can, uh, countries, it can be even uh, 24 gestational age uh, weeks. So when we are talking about miscarriage, so about first half of, of the pregnancy, uh, for the early uh, term, it's uh, chromosomal pathology. For the uh, last late terms, uh, it's more about... Uh, uh, blood clothing problems, but in the middle of these uh, terms, uh, we are usually talking about uh, uterine problems, uterine abnormality, uh, abnormality, endometrial abnormality, chronic endometritis, and also, uh, as I have mentioned, this is um, shortening of the uh, cervix, uh, cervical insufficiency, uh, insufficiency, which usually start from uh, 14, 15, 16 weeks of pregnancy. So this is most common uh, reason. And uh, when we are talking about terms more than 22, 24 weeks of pregnancy, it's not miscarriage, it's pregnancy losses, so it can be uh, intrauterine death. So for these conditions, they are absolutely different, uh, this uh, different reason. 
Thank you for your very first question, as I've mentioned earlier. And thank you, Dr. Xenia, for explaining, of course. Um, as you can see, more questions are coming up. Uh, now, uh, let's have a look. Olia has another one. Age 36, five miscarriages mm -hmm. in early pregnancy, five, six week pregnancy made with IUI, all tests that doctors need to see, karyotype, genetic testing, hormones, mm -hmm. hormones, et cetera, are made, and there is nothing to prove why is this happening. Any advice? Mm -hmm. So the same, the same very early pregnancy, very early ter term, and uh, it means that uh, often uh, when we are talking about karyotyping, we uh, just... Uh, it's not full explanation because uh, mostly chromosomal pathology in uh, embryos happens during uh, conception, during when uh, sperm fertilized uh, the eggs. So uh, in majority cases of chromosomal pathology in embryo, uh, the parents have normal karyotype. And uh, so normal uh, karyotype of parents doesn't mean that you didn't have a problem with a chromosome. Uh, but uh, the decision in this case, it's not very uh, easy because uh, age is 36. So chromosomal pathology is more realistic, enough realistic in this situation. And uh, it means that uh, from point of view, evidence-based medicine, uh, we have, uh, we should discuss with, with this patient uh, the same two ways or IVF program uh, with uh, PGT or natural conception with uh, possibly, um, possibly trying or don't do nothing or to continue provide uh, some testing which don't have um, uh, enough proofs. Uh, it means uh, that there are a, a lot of uh, so-called, for, for example, immunological testings, uh, but these testings uh, don't have enough uh, evidence base. And uh, maybe if patients have choose natural conception, maybe sometimes it's just, just one way to, to try to, to do something. Uh, but sometimes after explanation, patient choose uh, IVF with PGT. And in this case, it can be very helpful even if the reason of, uh, of the miscarriage was not in chromosomal pathology. Because uh, when we provide uh, genetic testing of embryo, it's, uh, uh, we can explain, uh, we can explain uh, prognosis for, for this patient and uh, we can explain previous situation for, uh, because we know for any uh, age group of patient we know how many normal and abnormal um, embryos do we normally have and if uh, for result of this patient we have uh, middle number of normal and abnormal um, embryos typical for this age, it means that the um, previous miscarriage was not uh, caused by chromosomal pathology and uh, we need to continue to continue uh, find something else, uh, immunological problems, some additional uh, blood clothing problems and so on. But if we, uh, if we choose natural conception, we don't know nothing about chromosomal status um, uh, of embryo. On, in this case, we, we uh, need just wait and maybe use progesterone and that's all. That can be checked. There are still uh, things that can be checked. I mean, uh, so yeah. I guess we still need to keep on trying and look for the solution. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much indeed, Olia. I do believe it has been helpful. Um, and of course, you can still ask more questions if you wish. Um, another question, uh, what about chronic endometritis? What is oh. your advice on that? What do we do with chronic endometritis? We treat uh, all, all, all uh, over the world. Uh, we have to treat firstly chronic endometritis uh, at least one time. 
but but what to do it uh, later it depends on uh, chronic endometritis in patient with RPL it's absolutely different Carolina we, we uh, discussed with you before this webinar it's absolutely different from uh, infertility patient group and uh, when we find out chronic endometritis after miscarriage we never know uh, really it was the the reason or uh, it was uh, the condition after after or because of uh, miscarriage because sometimes a chronic endometritis go after second third uh, and so on uh, miscarriage so uh when uh, we have chronic endometritis it's not just inflammation uh it means changes uh, changes in uh, endometrium sometimes with micro polyps sometimes with polyps sometimes with uh, uh, uterine adhesions and if uh, after the treating or before even treating of endometritis uh, we see on ultrasound uh, some changes in endometrium uh, will be better to provide hysteroscopy of course uh, if uh, there is no any signs of endometrial pathology on ultrasound you just need to treat and then i uh, no i uh, recommend to to provide uh, testing uh, to to be sure that uh, we have really treated this endometritis so provide uh, biopsy of endometrium months or two months after after the treatment but sometimes uh, at least 10 percent of situation uh, patient after treatment in uh, chronic endometritis and terminal endometritis, uh, the control results are uh, also positive. And the main question what to do with this patient. Uh, and there is uh, no uh, international uh, society recommendation for this situation for, for uh, resistant chronic endometritis when, when uh, control second test are positive. Uh, don't have any recommendation what to do to uh, to do um, second course of antibiotic. Uh, I don't like this idea. Uh, um, or just wait or just uh, plan pregnancy uh, or to do something else because for for the patient with uh, infertility in IVF program, answer on this question is uh, much easier because uh, in patient with IVF before transfer of embryo we can uh, use some medication to off menstrual bleeding one of the main reason for uh, recurrence of um, chronic endometritis that is uh, utero bleed every month and this is the possibly possibly reason for, for recurrence uh, in, of inflammation of uh, of endometri endometrium. So in case when we uh, when we plan embryo transfer, uh, we can just off by a different medication uh, in the uh, menstrual bleeding on uh, one or two on three months and then uh, do embryo transfer and usually uh, this uh, this uh, strategy strategy is um, effective enough uh, for, for the result but for natural conception it's not a decision we can off menstruation and plan natural conception it's it's uh, different so there is just just two uh, possibly ways uh, when we uh didn't treat uh, endometritis after after first course is uh, to to provide hysteroscopy and remove all the endometrium all the endometrium sometimes uh, it can be the problem because in some patient after uh full removing of endometrium it's good idea for the endometritis but uh, it's not a good idea because some some of them uh, then have very thin endometrium and adhesions or choose second course of uh, of antibiotic this is my answer all right definitely not an easy uh question as well because it's definitely yeah. uh, complicated 
Um, this yeah, is a complicated chronic... situation. Exactly. Yes, it's very yeah, not. Uh, no, we could have, no, I guess, we could have even a, a definitely a webinar on it, and it would be still hard yes, to yes, exactly yes, say yes, yes, yes. Um, that it's you know kind of yes or no kind of answer. Of course, thank you so much for bringing this, Roman. Of course, as well. Um, yeah, let's have a look. Uh, yes, he has another question. Forty-year-old, uh, second time failed to implant via Pixie. Have high NK cells. Any advice? Uh, if we are talking about, <laughs> it's not not about a current miscarriage, but about about patient. I think uh, patient with uh, Reef and uh, recurrent miscarriage is very close patient. But uh, I don't know. This is uh, the question about uh, about the uh, program with uh, genetic testing uh, of embryo or not. Uh, because um, I usually uh, usually uh, give advice about NK cells just uh, in um, infertility treatment programs, just for patients with genetically tested embryos. If it's not tested, if we don't know chromosomal status of, of the embryos, uh, it's not a good idea to do something with NK cells. Uh, but uh, if they are genetically tested, uh, we can we can do something a lot of ways, but uh, I have mentioned that it's no evidence base for, for this treatment. The, there are different type of treatment. It depends of uh, mm, not enough information because uh, NK sales uh, it's uh, seventy percent of uh, all all immune cells in endometrium, but it's not all. Because in a patient, we need to do some additional, additional tests to, to study uh, blood, to study T cells, to study different uh, part of uh, immune answer in endometrium in, in the blood. But it, uh, if it's just in cell cells, high level, uh, so it means that we, we can use some uh, some advices. I can uh, I can use uh, infusion of uh, intralipid. It's mo um, the most popular for today. Infusion it's very effective. It's not uh, it's cost effective. It's uh, medically affected uh, and uh, with very low uh, possibility uh, side effects. So. This is the most popular treatment of uh, high NK cell uh, level, but uh, one more uh, that that it's it can be not just NK cells. It can be about different uh, immunological disorders. And the first one, it's uh, genetic uh, genetic uh, status of all the embryos. Okay, thank you so much. I see. Is there if there's anything you would like to add? Yeah, just to clarify, perhaps. Go ahead, type this in, of course, yeah. okay? And I'm sure that could yeah, be yeah, happy yeah. to uh, give you more details. But thank you so much. Um, and yeah. so for now, at least, uh, might be our final question. So if you have any more, this is the final call for those, okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, type those in. And Ali has added one more question. So how useful is checking thrombophilies and antiphospholipid, phospholipid, sorry, antibodies in cases of antibodies. RPL? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, this is about different uh, different situations because about antiphospholipid antibodies, it's uh, uh, strongly recommended uh, for, for RPL patient in uh, any, uh, any term of pregnancy, uh, pregnancy losses. But uh, because there is strong association between uh, antiphospholipid syndrome and uh, recurrent miscarriage. But about uh, thrombophilia, it's a bit different because there is no, uh, no enough uh, proof for uh, association between thrombophilia and uh, uh, thrombophilia. When we test the patient on thrombophilia, it's not about the real risk for the pregnancy. It's about general risk. So. Testing for thrombophilia was uh, uh, started, uh, if I write, uh, about 50 years ago for patients uh, whose relatives had uh, thrombotic events. 
and uh, uh, the thrombophilia risk for, for those patients means just uh, have the additional high risk of thrombotic events in the future or not. Uh, so to, to do for them some additional tests, some additional uh, observation or what to do if uh, thrombosis occurs. So for, for RPL patient, it's a bit different. When the test um, some no, for example, our situation with uh, Victoria for my first case, uh, she was tested on, on thrombophilia. Um, I uh, I have mentioned the result. It was uh, some of middle risk uh, mutation, but but she had uh, so strong uh, other risk antiphospholipid antibodies. Uh, it's the first one. The second one, she was smoker. This is uh, additional risk for, for the thrombotic, thrombosis. She had a family risk of uh, thrombotic events for relatives of uh, first degree. It means that without, even if she doesn't have uh, any thrombophilia mutation, she uh, have enough thrombotic risk to, to make a decision uh, to provide prophylactic. So in this case, uh, thrombophilia testing uh, don't have any additional sense. And uh, if uh, we, have, we provide uh, thrombophilia, thrombophilia testing in patient uh, when uh, real pro real problem of uh, uh, real reason of uh, RPL was chromosomal pathology, uh, could we take the, the positive result for thrombophilia? Of course, yes, we can, we can uh, take, uh, get the result for, for example, for high risk thrombophilia, factor uh, two or factor five laden. Uh, does it mean that the problems uh, problem was in thrombophilia? No, the problem was in chromosomal pathology. And uh, thrombophilia risk means just that this patient uh, have a bit higher risk of thrombotic, uh, thrombotic events during her life, but it doesn't mean that it was the reason of recurrent miscarriage or any miscarriage. Fortunately, uh, approximately 90 Five percent of uh, all patients with mutation uh, don't have any thrombotic events during their life. So, fortunately, 95 uh, percent of all patients don't need uh, this test. And we often uh, often choose uh, choose the mistake. Uh, we often uh, have not correct conclusion uh, what to do with this patient. And often I, I can see patient in my practice, in my uh, consultation, that a patient have uh, five, three, four uh, miscarriage. And after second, she was, she was uh, studied on different test and it was positive on some thrombophilia mutation. And then during uh, third, fourth, five uh, pregnancy, she was unsuccessfully treated, but uh, low molar, uh, molecular weight heparin, and she had also miscarriage because the reason was absolutely different. So uh, up to me, testing for thrombophilia, it's um, not, not, uh, not obligatory, it's uh, not helpful uh, testing for, for the patient. Uh, syndrome, yes, of course. Okay, thank you for the clarification explaining I this. I uh, sometimes I expect I have the problem with this question, yeah. Sorry, right now it was a little bit breaking, but of course, uh, right now I can hear you. I believe everyone can hear you. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, you have explained this brilliantly yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much indeed. And as I mentioned, it looks like that was our final question for tonight. So I would like to thank everyone for your questions, for staying it's with us. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad that we were able to, to invite you and I'm glad that you were able to join us tonight and present this topic as well. So thank you, Dr. Xenia. Thank you. And
Before we finish, anything else you would like to add? Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, I can hear, yeah. Okay, but because the sound is breaking a bit right now. Grow, but yeah, it's it's almost, okay. <laughs> we are almost done. So, of course, I'm glad that we were able yeah, yeah. To, to make it without it. any issues. So, of course, don't worry. Um, and as you can see, there are some thank yous coming up your way here. So, as, as I mentioned, remember, it has been uh, recorded. Oh. Very Ukraine, you can see. <laughs> we, we cannot hear you very well, I'm afraid, thank right you, now. It's breaking uh, a bit, but uh, yeah. thank you thank so you much. Thank you for your attention. Ah, we need to. Thank okay. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Me. And of course, remember, it has been recorded. You will be able to find it on myavioffenses.com and also on our YouTube channel. And of course, we will be back next week on Monday. There is another webinar that uh, we will discuss, another success story. So uh, go ahead, uh, sign up, and that way you will have a chance to ask more and more questions. And of course, as always, you are able to ask questions uh, even after the webinar. You can get in touch with Dr. Xenia, her team at I've met. They will help you, no doubt, here. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening, everyone. And see you soon. Okay, Dr. Tsenia as well. See you soon. Bye.